My name is Carl Shannon Curry, Dr. Right. Shannon Curry. That's fine, ma'am. You're still under oath, so please have a seat, doctor. Good morning. Good morning, Dr. Curry. Good morning. Can you remind the jury who you are and what you do? Sure. I'm Dr. Shannon Curry. I'm a clinical and forensic psychologist, and I'm here today to rebut the testimony that was provided by Dr. Hughes. Which of the opinions rendered by Dr. Hughes do you intend to rebut? So there, generally speaking, there are three main categories that I'd like to talk about today. So the first is that uh, Dr. Hughes misrepresented the tests and the results that she utilized in her evaluation. She misrepresented my testing and the results that I obtained in my evaluation. And she communicated in a, man in a manner, provided testimony in a manner that presented um, essentially her own opinions and the self-report of Ms. Heard as facts. Okay, the first category you talked about was the misrepresentation of her own test methods and results. What do you mean by that? So uh, Dr. Hughes used, she stated that she administered 12 tests. Um, in actuality, she used eight checklists um, about half of those were symptom checklists. The other half were checklists, checklists about um, experiences that people can have with domestic violence. And those are not appropriate for forensic settings. They are easily exploited. Um, other issues that you intend to address relative to misrepresent misrepresentation of own results? Yes, so in addition to using these checklist measures, which are easily exploited in a forensic context, they're developed for research or treatment only. Um, she also stated that these checklists revealed things that they simply cannot reveal, especially in this context. Um, and uh, let's see, uh, she also misrepresented uh, information, clear indications on several of the objective measures that she offered. Um, and there were indications visible that Ms. Hurd had essentially uh, engaged in what we call response distortion. So clear indications of exaggeration on one of the measures that's specific to PTSD, clear minimization of symptoms intentional on another more broad personality and psychopathology based measure that she gave to Ms. Heard, which she did not acknowledge. Did you uh, intend to address anything relative to the CAPS-5? I did. So uh, Dr. Hughes administered the CAPS-5 about 10 days after I did, almost two years after she initially tested Ms. Heard. Um, and she did not administer the test appropriately. So she left major components blank. She didn't apply the scoring rules that are clearly outlined with the test. Um, and yet she diagnosed her misheard with PTSD based on that assessment. What about Dr. Hughes's use of the personality assessment inventory? So of the tests that Dr. Hughes administered, two would be considered, of those 12, two would be considered what we call forensically relevant instruments, meaning that they're objective enough and they provide us with some information about how the examinee approached the test, that it would be appropriate for this setting where the examinee is going to have a natural incentive to present themselves in a way that benefits the outcome of their case. Now, on the PAI, there were clear indications that uh, Ms. Hurd was responding and obtained scores in a manner that's consistent with individuals who have a personality disorder. And there was also an indication that uh, several scales, we call this a configuration. So you might have one main scale that you notice is elevated then you look for additional subscale information to get additional information on what could be elevating that scale. And there was a configuration that showed that even though Ms. Hurd had moderately elevated one of the scales that can be associated with trauma, um, that elevation is better explained by childhood or distant traumatic experiences like the complex trauma Ms. Hurd reported experiencing growing up. Okay. Um, you s said you, that uh, that 
Dr. Hughes utilized checklists that are not appropriate for forensic analysis. Can you yes. explain that? Yes. So, as I said, um, in any sort of forensic context, whether it's a civil or a criminal matter, a person who's being evaluated is going to have major incentive to present in a way that benefits the outcome of their case. So you always approach the examination, I believe Dr. Hughes said, with a healthy, healthy do dose of skepticism, but that alone is not enough. We have to operationalize that. So um, we actually have to administer very comprehensive objective tests that either control for attempts to manipulate the test results or reveal attempts to manipulate the test results so that we're not just blindly accepting the results or the self-report of the examinee. Um, how many tests were administered by Dr. Hughes? She said that she administered 12 tests. How many of them uh, were appropriate for forensic physical examination? So the trauma symptom inventory is appropriate. It's an objective measure and it does have two primary scales that look at how the person approached the test. The personality assessment inventory is an excellent test. It is a broad band measure, meaning that it captures not only symptoms of mental illness, but also general personality traits. Um, that also gives us pretty detailed scales similar to that one test I administered, the MMPI, that tell us a lot of nuanced information about the way the person approached the test. She also administered a malingering screen that can be very, very useful, but not in this context. So it's called the Miller Forensic Assessment Symptom Test. Um, it's a brief set of questions that you ask the examinee, and it's been shown by research to be extremely effective at identifying an examinee's attempts to fake a severe mental illness or psychosis. And psychosis is when somebody loses complete connection with reality. It's excellent for that purpose. It's actually been shown in the research to not be effective at all for identifying a respondent's attempts to fake PTSD, anxiety, or mood disorders. The questions are just too odd for somebody who has the wherewithal to be trying to have PTSD to endorse. They, they see through it. So she used that. Um, that's a fine test, but not appropriate for this context. Of the various tests that she administered, how many were these checklists? Eight of them. All right. And what are you talking about specifically? Okay. So I had mentioned that there were two main categories of checklists she used. The first is the symptom checklists. Um, those included the Beck Depression Inventory. It's a brief inventory of items that uh, essentially show all of the symptoms of depression that a person might have, and you rate which level of severity you have for each question. She also gave the Beck Anxiety Inventory, very similar, but just with questions about anxiety. She gave the Mood Disorder Questionnaire, which is a very brief, again, checklist. It shows symptoms of bipolar disorder. Bipolar disorder is a mood disorder where you might have an extended manic episode and then a very extended depressive episode. Um, and then she gave the post-traumatic stress disorder checklist, and that is a screening instrument only. Um, it contains every single symptom of PTSD. So there's a secondary danger here too, when you think about it, given that PTSD is the most frequently feigned and claimed diagnosis in civil courts, if you're handing somebody a checklist that lists every single symptom of PTSD, you're essentially teaching them all the little nuances that we're looking for to give that diagnosis. So she gave that to Ms. Hurd. Uh, Ms. Hurd endorsed most of the items, and Dr. Hughes diagnosed her with PTSD and substantiated that opinion by Ms. Hurd's checking those items on the PCL5. Okay. Um, were there another group of chest, uh, checklists that Dr. Hughes used? Yes, so uh, she also, had, oh, and I forgot one on the last because I don't think of it as one, but 
Previously, I'd explained, and I do not expect you to remember, it's called the Life Events Checklist, which is just an inventory of experiences a person may have gone through that are traumatic. Dr. Hughes also used that, and that's appropriate to use before the clinician administered PTSD scale, the gold standard, CAPS-5. However, she administered this long ago before she gave the CAPS-5. Um, now that going on to the second group, there were three checklists that she gave that are specific to abuse. And the first she gave, the danger assessment scale, was actually developed for use by nursing staff in an emergency room setting, specifically for female victims of intimate partner violence. The purpose of this is important because our forensic ethics, our psycho psychology ethics, talk a lot about relevance. Is the test relevant to the purpose? And the danger assessment scale, its initial purpose was completely different. This was developed to show high risk factors for dangerousness and pretty much to help a female who is in an extremely abusive partnership, who is in the emergency room with extreme injuries to stop rationalizing because if she has to check off all the things that have happened that year that have been dangerous. Does he own a gun? Has he, you know, I won't go into all of them, but the more she checks off, the more likely it is that she might realize that she is in imminent danger and then accept resources offered by the hospital and social work to protect her. That was the purpose of this scale. It was never intended to be used as a retrospective measure to look back in time and find out whether abuse was occurring based on one person's report years later in a litigation. Um, she also gave the conflict tactic scale revised, the second edition. Um, similarly, this scale was developed for research purposes, to research family violence. Um, again, there is no control for exaggeration or minimizing. It was just given to research participants anonymously so that we could get data on the prevalence of abuse and how abusive dynamics work. And on that, there's 39 questions where the respondent indicates essentially certain abusive behaviors they may have engaged in, and then 39 where they indicate behaviors their partner might have engaged in. And obviously, you can understand that in a forensic setting, the respondent is likely to put a very minimal amount of behaviors they engaged in, and then extremely uh, increase the number of behaviors their partner might have. Um, and then lastly, let's see, I, oh, the abusive behaviors observation checklist was the third checklist she gave. This one has not, there's, there's no known research even on its effectiveness for what it was developed. It's a theoretical, very brief checklist that was meant to be used for therapy where an individual who had experienced domestic violence could essentially read through some of the behaviors that constitute violence that they might not have been aware of. And if those behaviors applied to them, or if some of those coping strategies were ones they utilized, they would check that off. And then they have a way to talk about it because now it's been put to words. Again, this is similarly problematic. If you're in uh, a civil litigation, the person's motivated to have the results be consistent with a claim or an allegation of intimate partner violence and an allegation that they've been severely harmed, then they could simply just check off more. And not only that, but checklists like this one specifically give a lot of nuanced information about what clinicians might be looking for when they're assessing whether violence was present or whether the person's self-report is consistent with a genuine self-report of having been victimized. They're given all that information that we might be looking for. Can you talk specifically about Dr. Hughes's use of the, I think you called it the PCL-5? Yes. So the PCL-5 is the post-traumatic stress disorder checklist. This is different, not to be confused with the CAPS-5, which I've talked about previously as being the gold standard. The PCL-5, was developed by the National Center of PTSD. It's intended for treatment. So if I were, for instance, working with a service member who I know had, um, had been in combat, I would probably give this as a standard with my intake. Before we do the diagnostic interview, it kind of gives me a read on how somebody who's there for treatment, who we assume can be taken at their word because 
If they give us correct information, they're going to get an appropriate treatment. And if they give us incorrect, they might not get the treatment they need. So I would give this checklist to them. And then if they recognize some of those symptoms of PTSD, they could check it off. And that would probably indicate to me that I need to then do the next step if they're checking off more items than not. I would probably decide to administer the clinician-administered PTSD scale, that gold standard interview, to find out more about a diagnosis. The last thing is what everybody refers to as the CAPS-5? Yes, the CAPS-5. All right. What about, um, well, you talked about forensic use. What do you mean by that? So uh, when I'm talking about a uh, forensic evaluation, that's an evaluation that doesn't, isn't done for therapy or treatment. It's specifically to assist the fact finder, to assist the judge or the jury in the court by providing information about the psychological status about an individual. And that's an important delineation too. We are not psychologists. I wish we were mind readers. I wish we had a crystal ball and could find out whether intimate partner violence occurred and look back in the past. But it's nothing like that. Really, uh, it's a lot less interesting. We look at data. We have to control for those response biases. And then we also are looking at functioning, which um, is really the bottom line of the assessment. Did the person have a change in functioning from before the alleged trauma, or in this case, the alleged IPV, to after? Is there a decline in the way they're going about their lives? Can your honor, may we approach? All right. Okay, a sidebar, Dr. Shannon Curry uh, on the stand still with us is Michelle Thomas. She's in Silver Spring, Maryland, in the D.C. area there. Um, gives us a chance to talk about Kate Moss. Uh, very quick, to the point, didn't throw me down the stairs. No cross. Your thoughts on, the, on Kate Moss? I mean, they, she was obviously convincing and compelling, and um, they kept her testimony so concise that there really wasn't much to, to cross on. Her, her testimony and explanation of what happened was believable, it was credible, and so there really wasn't much left there. They, they kept it narrowed, her testimony narrowed to rebut specifically the allegation regarding um, Johnny Depp throwing her down the steps. She denied that. There's not much more to say. It would have been nice if they could have found something to cross-examine her on, just to sort of just give that illusion of pushing back, but there really wasn't much there. Yeah, and you don't want to give the uh, other impression that you're pushing back on Kate Moss. Are you kidding me? Um, There's that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, sidebar is broken up. Let's go back in. Dr. Curry, um Let's look back at uh, some of those domestic violence checklists that you were talking about. Okay. And um, did you see any problem with the use of those? Yes. What problems did you see? Well, uh, doctor, first of all, they shouldn't be used. So we do have professional standards that require that we utilize instruments that are relevant and appropriate for the particular setting um, and that we substantiate our opinions based on data that is reliable from tested, accurate, reliable tests for the purpose. Um, so there's that. It's inconsistent with the ethics. Um, and essentially, they, they just shouldn't be used. They don't provide us with the robust information that it would be expected in such a high stakes setting. Would you have expected Dr. Hughes to comment on the limitations of the checklist she was using? Yes. So, uh, first of all, uh, Dr. Hughes provided opinions based on these checklists. So she referenced especially the danger assessment scale several times throughout her testimony, uh, stating that Ms. Hurd was in a very dangerous situation. Uh, we also have an ethical guideline and a professional standard as well that indicate that whenever there is question about the reliability and the validity, and in psychology, we use the term validity to talk about accuracy, of any of the methods that we're using to uh, collect data, we clearly communicate not only that there are limitations to our opinions, but we also need to provide the fact finder with information about what the potential implications or impact could actually be. So uh, for instance, if we use a scale 
um, that's idiosyncratic for the purpose, but we would first need to explain why we made that decision to not follow standard procedures. Um, and then we would need to explain the use of this scale might uh, introduce some potential uh, exaggeration of this symptom. And, and so I'm trying to control for that that way, but that was one of the limitations of my opinion. You have to make it very clear. Transparency is really at the center of good science in general. Um, you talked a little bit about uh, ignoring response distortion. What is response distortion? Response distortion is a term that speaks generally about an examinee approaching a test and providing answers that are either exaggerated or minimized, but in some way an inaccurate representation of their current mental status or their experience. What uh, test do you believe that Dr. Hughes failed to acknowledge response distortion on? So uh, she administered the personality assessment inventory, which is similar to the test I gave them, MPI-2. It's that general broadband measure of uh, psychopathology symptoms um, and personality traits. It includes several scales um, that are very good at detecting either exaggeration, minimization, or even trying to claim that you have unusually good qualities. Um, on that test, uh, there were clear indicators that Ms. Heard, very similar to the way she approached my MMPI, engaged in defensiveness. Um, and in fact, there's a function that you can look at. So you have that main scale elevation, we call it positive impression management, was elevated. And then, because we want to make sure that somebody isn't elevating that scale just because they have such well-being, there are additional configurations of scales that you can look at to find out what's going on. And so the casual discriminant function is uh, sort of the name of one of these configurations, these uh, equations that are done. And she was highly elevated on that. Um, in fact, that elevation tells you that no, this isn't accidental. This isn't because she's just doing so well in life that she has an extremely, extremely low amount of problems. No, this is an intentional over-reporting, or I'm sorry, an intentional um, effort to minimize any uh, appearance of having problems. Now, you may have addressed this, but there was a reference to malingering. Yes. So what's interesting about Ms. Hurd's approach to different tests is that it seems to be influenced by what we call the face validity of questions on the test. So if a test looks like it's measuring PTSD, you see exaggeration on her validity scales. If the test has less face valid questions, for instance, the personality assessment, which Dr. Hughes administered, the MMPI-2, which I administered, where she can't quite figure out what the questions are asking, they seem really banal in general. On those, you see extreme defensiveness, minimization of any potential pathology, essentially presenting herself as perfect and free of any mental illness or personality disorder. But on the trauma symptom inventory, which Dr. Hughes administered, um, it, that was the one that I previously indicated for ease of explanation when the test results come out for how the person approaches the test, that test itself prints it as a percentage. And there's a really excellent scale for finding out if a person is exaggerating their symptoms of PTSD. It's called the atypical response scale. And the TSI-2 is the revised version of this test, and that scale was improved this time around to really try to be a clean indication of, is this person exaggerating? And it, it puts quite high questions in the test that are so unusual, they might sound like PTSD, but even the most severe cases of PTSD don't have these symptoms. And so somebody who's intentionally trying to exaggerate PTSD, or possibly unintentionally, but nonetheless, who's exaggerating it, is likely to endorse these items, even though they're not real PTSD symptoms. Ms. Hurd scored so highly on this that even if there is, although Dr. Hughes correctly said, there tends to be a negative skew when people have the high levels of distress that's associated with PTSD, so sometimes people score higher on this even when they do have PTSD, 
she scored so high that that is effectively ruled out as a possibility. Okay. Um, what about Dr. Hughes's administration and use of the CAPS-5? Okay, yes. So Dr. Hughes had diagnosed Ms. Hurd with PTSD back in 2019 when she began testing her. It wasn't until two years later, more than two years later, 10 days after I administered the CAPS-5 with Ms. Hurd, that Dr. Hughes had an impromptu evaluation session remotely with Ms. Hurd and administered the CAPS-5. She had previously diagnosed PTSD without using what we consider to be the gold standard PTSD diagnostic interview. Dr. Shannon Curry and continues her testimony as we approach the top of the hour. We need to step aside and take a break. We want to thank Michelle Thomas for her time and expertise. More after this. For your hard work, pays off. They are. Welcome back to Court TV Live. I'm Ted Rollins. Glad to have you along with us on this Wednesday. The Wednesday, the final week of testimony in Johnny Depp versus Amber Heard. It is day two of test, 22 of testimony. Dr. Shannon Curry is back on the witness stand as an expert for Johnny Depp in his rebuttal. Well, let's go back into the courtroom, pick it up right where we left off. Again, when we're doing a forensic evaluation, it is an important responsibility and part of our ethics and professional standards are that we document everything to allow for transparency and full judicial scrutiny. And Dr. Hughes administered in incorrectly. She left huge sections, very relevant sections blank. There's no way to understand why she scored it as high as she did based on the information that's provided. You're essentially supposed to notate the examinee's responses as verbatim as possible to explain your reasoning and implying their scoring procedure. It's a standardized test. And if you don't follow those standard procedures, it's completely invalid. Not only that, but after, it looks as though Dr. Hughes further invalidated it by trying to show that she had assessed for the childhood trauma impact. And it's, she had said that she went back and asked the childhood question, but you can't do that. If you're assessing for two separate periods of one's life to find out their relatedness to PTSD, you do two separate CAPS interviews, period. You don't create your own question system. That is non-standard administration of the test and it invalidates it. All right. Um, you also mentioned with respect to the PAI or the personality assessment in inventory that Dr. Hughes failed to mention uh, some elements. Uh, what did she fail to mention? Oh, okay. So on the personality assessment inventory, so first she failed to mention that there was it were clear indications of response distortion. She also failed to mention that uh, Ms. Hurd scored in her score profile against their main scores. She did elevate a score for the borderline personality disorder sort of section, but that in and of itself would not indicate a diagnosis. However, the configuration of her scores overall is consistent with that. And in fact, it's one of the diagnostic suggestions given by the test itself. Um, and then also there's a configuration around Ms. Hurd's trauma responses on that particular test which demonstrates that it is more likely that those symptoms were reported in relation to something in the distant childhood, it's more consistent with childhood chronic abuse, than present circumstances or recent circumstances. Okay, I, I think you said in addition to uh, the, the issues with her own testing, uh, Dr. Hughes misrepresented your results. She did. Um, can you tell us how? So, well, I would say the main issue was that she said that Ms. Hurd obtained a normal profile on my MMPI too. All right. How do you dif disagree with uh, Dr. Hughes relative to the profile? Okay. So the profile was not normal. So Ms. Hurd already had subtle elevations just by the, the test by itself as it came out. There were subtle elevations, but they were elevations that if the validity scales hadn't been as elevated as they were, you might have said, this person has some traits, but this isn't necessarily at the level of a true pathology. However, Ms. Hurd elevated a scale 
that essentially is a defensiveness scale on this test. And when you're giving this test, you always are mindful of different norms or groups who may have similar profiles. And there are certain groups of litigants who tend to elevate this scale as well. So I had that in mind. However, Ms. Hurd elevated this so much that it was far beyond the mean for the, the litigants that are known to have the highest levels of this scale, this defensiveness scale. And when this scale is elevated to the level that it is, you automatically understand that it is very likely that those clinical scales, we, I keep doing this because I'm seeing it in my head, it looks like sort of uh, an ECT. It's sort of these peaks you see on a graph. And when you see these peaks, and you have this huge peak over here for the defensiveness scale, what you know is that these peaks are artificially, they've been lowered or suppressed based on the respondent being so defensive. They still detected what's likely there for her, but it's not as high as it should be. So you make an adjustment. And the recommendation is that anything at 60 or above, we call it a T-score of 60, or above is considered significant. Ms. Hurd's were already over 60. Some were quite higher than that. And then you see a very clear profile. And that was how I got that. I had mentioned a 3-6 code type. Now, the test does its own correction also for some of the scores, but not the ones that are her main code type. With the test correction, she had a 1-3-6 code type, which is very similar. What is a 3-6 code type? A 3-6 code type is something that has been researched and found to be highly correlated or probabilistic of certain behavioral tendencies and personality traits. And the traits with a 3-6 code type tend to be marked by a lot of externalization of blame, um, a lot of denial about one's own personal faults, um, intentional or not intentional, but just extreme denial, hostility that is strongly controlled and suppressed. The person may not even realize how hostile they are, but family members, those closest to them, are very likely to report that they lose their temper, and when they lose their temper, it explodes. Uh, we have sort of what we call a cookbook for these code types, which ended, will provide you with all the information that's been researched to be associated with them. And our cookbook actually states that that 3-6 profile specifically tends to be associated with cruel and ruthless behavior, particularly to those who they perceive as less powerful than them and subordinates. Describe for the jury the review process that you, did, that you went through relative to the MMPI. So uh, I conducted a very methodical analysis of the scores. I do this for every test, and I also did it when I was reviewing Dr. Hughes's scores. Um, so what you haven't seen that's in Discovery is that I created a 25-page outline just of her scores with, uh, and it's sort of a table. So I'll put the score, I'll do it in sections so that I can understand different groupings, different research studies, and I start with looking at all the validity scales. So I put in the score, I put, and I'll even color the table to show me if it's kind of in the high zone, moderate zone, or low, and then if it's low, is it a significant low score or is it just low so it doesn't mean anything? And then I, in the right side, I put all the research data that I found on this particular scale score. And so I start with the validity scales, the way the person approached the test. Then I go down to essentially, we call these the first factors. So their overall sense of well-being and how well they cope. On this, actually, Ms. Hurd's, she endorsed scores or uh, endorsed items that were the opposite of PTSD. So really saying that she feels free of distress um, and that she views herself very well. Uh, so then I go down to control, self-control, loss of control, coping abilities, and I put in the scores that are associated with that in the research and the test development. Then I go down to clinical and personality pathology, and I look at all the scores that are significant there, first with the top-level main scores, then with all of the different subscores. again, citing the research, the meaning, the level of elevation, and what that means. And then I do comparison with different research groups. So for Ms. Hurd, 
I did a section that looked at all sorts of different scores that have been implicated with a PTSD presentation to see if any of those were consistent. Uh, I can't remember how many there were. I think I put 13 on there, but I could be wrong. Uh, but I believe that there was only one that could even be in some research is sometimes associated with it, but it was general anxiety, which turned out to be more trait specific. I looked at the scores that are typical of women with IPV. Hers were not consistent at all with those. I looked at the scores that were consistent with people who are frequently in litigation. Hers actually were very highly correlated with those. That tends to be also consistent with a 3-6 code type. And the reason for that is believed to be that they tend to perceive themselves often as victims who need to avenge wrongs. Were there other results you believe Dr. Hughes to have misrepresented? For um, instance, whatever. the TSI-2. Yes. Um, so Dr. Hughes generally said that testing supported PTSD and that there was an etiology for her trauma of intimate partner violence. Um, she did reference that uh, essentially the, I can't remember if she said that the trauma symptom inventory indicated PTSD, but she did say that the elevation on that validity scale is consistent with PTSD and that's simply not true. Um, that scale was designed and has been tested and shown to be there to show when somebody is endorsing extremely unusual items that are not consistent with PTSD. And even though when some people are experiencing PTSD, their distress level is so high that they'll engage in what we call a cry for help, and they may sometimes exaggerate distress. Again, when you're looking at scores as high as Ms. Hurd's, and then you're not seeing indications of PTSD in the more subtle tests where she doesn't know what she's endorsing, there's, it's good evidence that her over-endorsement on that one test um, is because of the reason the scale was made to detect exaggeration and feigning of symptoms. Is this the test that uh, resulted in the 98 percentile yes. score? Yes, on that, square, on that atypical response scale. And, and what does that 98th percentile score represent? So that 98th percentile score just represents that among 98% 98, 98 of people who take that test would not have endorsed. She scored more of those unusual items that are not consistent with PTSD than 98% of people who have ever taken that test. Does that relate to this concept you talked about before called feigning? Yes. What is feigning again? Well, feigning is essentially exaggerating symptoms of a disorder. Yeah. Um, Quick break, back with more testimony. It's Johnny Depp versus Amber Heard, day 22, when we return. Go to prettylitter.com. We go to the courtroom. It's still direct on the rebuttal case, the second appearance for Dr. Shannon Curry. Let's go back in, right where we left off. Um, I think the third thing you indicated you were going to talk about was uh, self-reports and personal opinion as facts. What are you talking about there? So in any science and in psychology specifically, it's really important that we use precise language and we say what we mean and we do not present opinions as facts because when you are in the role of an expert witness um, or an expert in any setting, essentially a lay person may not be able to detect the difference between something that is a personal opinion that you're giving versus something that is substantiated by research data, test data, reliable test methods. So uh, our ethics talk about, especially the specialty guidelines of forensic psychology, the responsibility we have to distinguish between data then inferences we're making from that data, what the data can mean, sort of like those tables I do. I put the data, the inferences based on the research, and then what my ultimate opinion is integrating all of that data. And it's very important that we clarify that to the fact finder, to the judge, the jury, that's our responsibility, that we do not cloak personal opinions or the self-report of an examinee as an expert 
fact or somehow scientifically based when it is just a personal opinion or self-report of an examinee. What do you mean by self-report? The self-report is essentially what the examinee tells you during the interview. Okay. Um, when did Dr. Hughes do this most? She did this most when describing instances of alleged IPV. Um, and there's also an issue there because one of our ethics also discusses the importance of relevance and withholding, essentially constraining our testimony to the data and not including private information, personal information that unnecessarily compromises the dignity of uh, any of the litigants. She provided a lot of uh, what was Ms. Hurd's report to her, the allegations of abuse, when describing Mr. Depp, who she had not examined, when describing Mr. Depp's behavior, his motivations. I believe she used the word obsessive jealousy quite a few times, talked about Ms. Hurd being in a highly dangerous situation. These are simply things that we cannot detect based on testing and a psychological evaluation. We have to evaluate the person, we have to get consent, um, and we can only describe an individual, not whether or not IPV has occurred. And we certainly shouldn't go into explicit details about sexual encounters or other things that are highly prejudicial, shocking, and hard to forget. All right. Um, Dr. Hughes says that Ms. Hurd has PTSD. Do you agree? I do not. Why not? The results of my multi-method comprehensive evaluation based on carefully selected, researched, relevant test, method, test instruments based on comparing those instruments to Ms. Hurd's self-report, observing Ms. Hurd's behavior over 12 direct hours of assessment, reviewing copious notes from prior therapists who indicated symptoms in their notes, reviewing the notes of Nurse Filotti, previously Nurse Borum, who spent, I believe at one point, almost two months with Ms. Hurd daily, um, reviewing the notes of her treating providers, uh, let's see, uh, all of the legal documents and discovery, there was no evidence of PTSD. How is evidence of PTSD generally uh, exhibited? So really the bottom line in a forensic psychological evaluation is a change in functioning. That's what we're looking for. Again, I said, we don't have a crystal ball. We're not wizards. We can't get into somebody's head. What we're looking for were their identifiable changes in the way the person engaged in their world. Were they able to keep a job? PTSD is an extremely disabling diagnosis. When a person has true PTSD, it is difficult for them to work. You'll see unemployment, job loss, it causes extreme levels of distress and impairment. There's divorce, there's uh, isolation and estrangement from children, from family members, extreme alcohol abuse, often a, a string of sudden DUIs when the person never had any before. They become homebound, they can't go to the store. They're certainly not going to events. They're not uh, having success in their film career, usually. They're not exercising every day, pursuing their hobbies, being avid readers, obtaining level three sommelier training, having uh, dinner parties with friends, speaking to public groups. Uh, those are just indications of very high functioning. And when you're looking for a decrease in functioning over time, that is inconsistent with that decrease. What about Dr. Hughes's suggestion that Mr. Waldman's statements served as a trigger for Ms. Hurd's PTSD? All right. All right, sidebar, let's uh, slip in a commercial break here and we'll have more from Dr. Shan Curry right after this. Stay with us. 6363. Dr. Shannon Curry is back on the stand. We've been watching her uh, for the most of the morning. Kate Moss started the day for the Depp team, but she has taken the rest of it. Let's go back in after the sidebar concluded. 
Dr. Hughes had suggested that uh, perhaps Ms. Hurd's PTSD was somehow triggered. What's your view on that? I would say that it can't be triggered if PTSD isn't present. Thank you very much, doctor. All right, cross-examination. Thank you. All right, what do you do with Dr. Hughes on cross? Let's see how aggressive it is. Keep Dr. in mind Curry, time, I too. I want to make sure oh, here we that go. Uh, we all remember, you're not board certified, correct? No, I'm not. OK. And you've been licensed for how long? I've been licensed for 10 years. OK. And you are being paid by Mr. Depp's legal team to be here, correct? Yes. How much have you charged so far? I actually don't know. Over 100,000? I truly don't know. I don't do my own books. Over 200,000? I don't know. Over 300,000? That would be way too much, but I do not know. OK. Um, now, just so that we all remember, you had dinner at Mr. Depp's house for three to four hours with Mr. Depp, Mr. Waldman, Mr. Chu, and Ms. Vasquez, correct? I was interviewed. I asked if there was anything I could eat because at about three hours I started to get hungry. Mr. Depp then offered to order takeout for the entire team. So you had dinner with, at Mr. Depp's home with Mr. Waldman, Mr. Chu, Ms. Vasquez, and Mr. Dow, correct? Yes. And you had drinks as well, correct? I actually don't know. I do remember that there were drinks. Do you recall testifying earlier that you did have a drink, a mule something? No, I remember testifying that there might have been a mule, a Moscow mule. OK, thank you. We, did, we didn't have animals there as well, right? No animals. OK, that's good to know. Mm -hmm. and, and you talked about transparency. I just want to make sure you had several uh, designations, expert designations and reports in this case, correct? Yes. And in not one of them did you disclose that you had dinner and drinks at Mr. Depp's house for three to four hours with Mr. Waldman, Mr. Chu, and Ms. Vasquez. Is that correct? Ms. Bredehoff, you're mischaracterizing what occurred. I, Dr. Curry, please answer the question. Not once did you disclose this in any of your reports. I did not correct? disclose that I was interviewed as that standard procedure. Uh, but it's true that you have never gone to a client's house to be interviewed for an expert witness position, correct? Yes, because I never had a client that was essentially homebound because of their celebrity status. All right. And, and you talked to Mr. Depp for three to four hours uh, before taking on the role of assessing Ms. Hurd and deciding whether she was suffering from any distress, correct? I did not talk to Mr. Depp. I was talking to his legal team, and he was there to observe. He was present for the three to four yes. hours. Oh, and are you saying now he just stayed silent and said nothing all, all day? I don't recall what he didn't or didn't do. I was answering questions. OK. Now, your expertise here is limited to whether Amber Heard suffers from PTSD currently. Is that correct? Yes, I was okay. tasked with conducting an evaluation okay. to determine Ms. Heard's mental you know, status. We're all on very, very strict time limitations okay. because we've promised to get this case to the jury. So mm -hmm. I'd really appreciate if you just answer my question rather than trying to go for sure. it. Okay? Thank you very much. Now, after you did had the dinner, you then provided a designation in February of 2021 in which you said, and this is long before you ever saw Amber Heard, correct? You said that Amber Heard, quote, exhibits patterns of behavior that are consistent with co-occurring cluster B personality disorder traits, especially borderline personality disorder, end of quote, correct? No. No, you, we went through this before. We did. But, and, and that was on the designation, was it not? I, I told you last time that I did not write that. OK. And you don't know who did on the legal team, correct? No. OK. And then I also asked you, if you may recall, whether you listened to the audio recording in which Mr. Depp taunted Amber Heard that she had a borderline personality disorder. Do you recall that? I recall you asking me that, yes. Did you recall listening to that audio tape? I don't recall Mr. Depp taunting Ms. Heard. Okay. I do recall 
that he at some point suggested she might have that diagnosis. Okay, and that was back in these audio tapes back when they were together, correct? Yes. Okay. Now, you've never before been asked to testify or serve as an expert with respect to someone who has bipolar disorder, correct? No, as I previously stated, that's not true. All right. Let's get you that position. Um, my extra copies were all distributed before. Does everybody have those? Not up here anymore. Okay. Then my apologies, but I'm going to go again. Your Honor, can we approach? All right. Sidebar, let's get a break in more from Shannon Curry and the cross-examination of the expert witness next. <music> Elaine Brennerhoff is conducting the cross-examination of Dr. Shannon Curry. Let's pick it up right where we left off. Now, you recall testifying in your deposition on March 21, 2022, correct? Yes. And you were under oath at that time, correct? Yes. And the question I just showed you on page 207, line 5, have you ever been asked to testify or serve as an expert with respect to whether someone has bipolar disorder? And your answer at that time was no, correct? Yes, I had forgotten that case. Okay. And have you ever been asked to testify whether anyone has behavioral or characterological conduct that suggests they may be an IPV perpetrator? I can't, yeah, I may have. It's difficult after about 250 cases, it's difficult to remember specifically. All right, and have you ever been qualified as an expert in the area of IPV? No. And have you ever been qualified to testify as an expert in domestic abuse or violence? Violent, oh, domestic. Abuse uh, or violence? Yes, that's been a component of testimony. May I approach you in your All right. You're still on pace. Me on that, can I take a look? Do you want? Okay. Line 16 of page 207. Have you ever been qualified as an expert in the area of IPV? Your answer on line 20 was no, under oath, correct? Then the next question, have you ever been qualified to testify as an expert in domestic abuse or violence? That and goes into page 208, line four. The answer then under oath was no. Now, you would agree that the literature is quite clear that trauma-based sy symptoms such as PTSD or complex PTSD have symptoms that overlap with borderline personality disorder and histrionic personality disorder, yes? Yes. Okay, and you would agree that it's important to use valid and reliable measures for an accurate diagnosis, correct? Absolutely. Okay, you chose, however, not to administer the Structured Clinical Interview for DSM-5 Personality Disorders, the SCID, is that correct? I did. Okay. And would you agree that that is a state-of-the-art structured clinical interview? Not for a forensic evaluation with a sophisticated examinee. But to determine if a personality disorder is present? You no, not in this setting. You don't agree with that? I do not. You don't agree that that is the gold standard assessment for reliable, accurate psychiatric diagnosis? It's a good one, but for treatment settings especially. Okay. Now, did Ms. Hurd, you said you talked about, you read all of the treatment records, right? Yes. Okay. Do you recall reading the treatment records for the psychologist Bonnie Jacobs, who saw Amber Heard over five years? I do. And did you see anything in Bonnie Jacobs' notes over five years in which she diagnosed Ms. Heard with borderline personality or histrionic personality disorder? No. Now, you also saw the notes of Dr. Con Con Connell Cohen, correct? Mm -hmm. And you even attended his deposition, correct? Yes. All right. And he saw Amber for roughly two years. He was part of the Dr. Kipper connection, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Right? Okay. And did you see anything in Dr. Cowan's notes 
Um, and did he say in his deposition that he diagnosed Amber Heard with borderline personality disorder or histrionic personality disorder? I saw the symptoms clearly delineated throughout his notes and in his deposition. He does not use diagnoses, so he would not have diagnosed her. He said specifically in his deposition he did not diagnose her with that, correct? Yes, and he also specifically stated that he does not use diagnoses. All right. And you also have seen Dr. Banks, Dr. Amy Banks, the psychiatrist, mm -hmm. her deposition, correct? Yes. And did, did Dr. Not Anderson? her deposition. I reviewed her notes in the transcript. All right. Did Dr. Anderson diagnose Ms. Heard with pers borderline personality disorder or is a histrionic personality disorder? Disorder. I don't believe she pri provided any diagnosis since she was a couples therapist. All right. Now, you've said quite a bit about Don Hughes, but do you remember how many years of experience Don Hughes has in IPV and domestic abuse and violence? I know it's quite a bit. Extensive. And she is board certified, correct? Yes, she is. All right. And she spent 29 hours of examination with Amber Heard, she, did she not? Yes, mostly okay. interviewing. All right, and she admitted, and she interviewed her therapists, Bonnie Jacobs and Conan Cowell, correct? Yes. And she also interviewed Amber's late mother. Yes. Okay, and she administered 12 different tests over the period of that time, correct? Well, as I said, the majority of those were checklists, which are inappropriate for the forensic setting. I, I understand that's what mm -hmm. you say, but she administered 12 different tests, correct? If you want to qualify them as tests, sure. Okay. And so you did you disregard what it no, I'm not even gonna say that. Okay. Let's go to the CAPS five and PTSD. Now you assessed Ms. Hurd's traumas in her life, correct? Uh Yes, I did uh, okay. give her an instrument to assess for any trauma exposure throughout the entire lifespan. Yes, yes, it's fine. And you wrote that Ms. Hurd's exposure to a traumatic event, namely one of the sexual assaults by Mr. Depp, more than satisfied this requirement. Did you not write that in your notes? That is not what I wrote in my notes. Do you have my notes? So we and can you look administered at that? a structured clinical interview based on that trauma, correct? Not exactly. It's not quite right. Okay. Now, Dr. Hughes administered a full intimate partner violence assessment, correct? That's not a psychological assessment. We can't assess for intimate partner violence. That's an event. Dr. Hughes administered a full intimate partner violence assessment, correct? She stated that, and that's actually something I'm rebutting today. Okay, and, and you reviewed her psychological testing? Correct? I sure did, yes. Okay, and are you aware that in September 2019, Ms. Hurd had a trauma-based symptom on many of those valid tests? Um, can you be a little bit more specific? Many of those do valid you, tests, which tests are you talking about? Do you have a recollection of that, September 2019? She administered all of her testing in September 2019, so I'm not sure which one, oh, except for the CAPS-5, which was 10 days after mine in 2021. Now, Dr. Hughes clinically evaluated those symptoms and established that Ms. Hurd does have PTSD from the totality of the intimate partner violence by Mr. Depp, correct? That's what she stated, yes. Okay. Now, Dr. Anderson's clinical notes that said Amber had come to Objection, a hearsay. I, have, I haven't even asked the question yet, Your Honor. Are you going to read her notes? Well, let me, no, no, actually, I, I wasn't going to read her no, notes. Okay. I was going to ask a particular question. Okay. You talked about danger. Do you recall that in your testimony? Yes. All right. Now, if, if a, a patient comes to you as a couple's therapist mm -hmm. with two black eyes, would you assess the, that there may be a potential danger there? Sure. Okay. Did you read Dr. Anderson's notes? I believe I did. Now, you administered the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory 2, the MMPI 2. Do you recall that? Yes. And you used that to determine whether Amber had PTSD, right? It, not by itself, but it was a part of the data. Okay. And in the 60 to 70 T-score range for that test, which, quote, deliberate attempts to mislead are uncommon, common, end quote. Isn't that correct? Sorry, could you repeat that? In the T-score... Mm -hmm. section mm -hmm. of that, for which assesses deliberate attempts to mislead. Do you recall? She scored 
a 60 on that test, correct? So there are multiple T-scores for each scale, so I'm not sure which scale you're talking about. Okay. Well, we can deal with that later. So okay. you would agree that you need to follow ethics and best practices in forensic psychology, correct? Yes. Okay. And the two primary sources are the American Psychological Association ethical principles and professional code of conduct, right? Mm-hmm. And the American Psychological Association's specialty guidelines for forensic psychology, correct? Yes. And specialty guidelines 1.02 states that forensic practitioners quote, strive for accuracy, impartiality, fairness, and independence, correct? Yes. Okay. And specialty guidelines 1.03 states that you have to avoid a conflict of interest, correct? Yes. Okay. Now, in addition to not listing the four hours you spent with Mr. Depp, Mr. Waldman, Mr. Chu, and Ms. Vasquez, you also did not list that you spent an hour with Dr. Shaw, correct? That's incorrect. You, you say that, you, that the designation I, said that you spent During an my hour? deposition, I also clarified this. I didn't spend an hour with Dr. Shaw. There was an introduction with the attorneys present on Zoom. My time on that call was less than 30 minutes. Okay, but you still didn't disclose it, did you, in your reports? No. Okay. Now... You are not, you have not been asked to testify about Ms. Hurd's behavior in the context of her relationship with Mr. Depp. Is that correct? I was asked to testify about somebody's behavioral mental status in general, so that can include behavior in, involved in a relationship with Mr. Depp, but not specifically. Can you, can you pull up day 10 of uh, the trial? Testimony at page 2710. Are you able to do that yourself? 2710, line, lines 12 through 18. May we approach? All right. All right. All right. All right. Sidebar, uh, Dr. Shannon Curry continues on cross-examination. This is rebuttal, her second time around, and her goal is to refute what we heard from Dr. Dawn Hughes, who, of course, was the expert put forth for Amber Heard. The old battle of the experts. Sidebar broken up. Let's go back. Also yep. have, okay. Yep. So, Dr. Curry, this is your testimony from day 10 in this case, and if you can look at page 2710, um, line 13, now, is it your, my question was, now, is it your testimony under oath today that you have not been asked to testify concerning Ms. Hurd's behavior in the context of her relationship with Mr. Depp, including any abuse? And your answer under oath to this jury that day was, that's correct. Yes. Correct? I okay. still agree with that to that question. All right. And you have not made any determinations, including any opinions, that Ms. Hurd abused Mr. Depp or Mr. Depp abused Ms. Hurd, correct? Correct. Okay, and, and in fact, you said that's outside the scope. Yes. Right? Okay. Of psychology. And you cannot testify whether Amber Heard suffered any emotional distress as a result of any of the defamatory comments that she has alleged Mr. Waldman made through Mr. Depp, or Mr. Depp made through Mr. Waldman, correct? Objection, Your Honor. Do you want me to read my response? What's sure. your objection? I'm sorry. What I, oh, hold on, Dr. Sorry, Your Honor. That's okay. Oh, what's the objection? Are you on approach? Okay. Another sidebar to um, figure this out. It's been common in this trial because they don't want speaking objections. You have to get up there, have the judge rule, and go back to it. You don't have to send the jury out. Elaine Bredehoff, keep in mind the time issue here. How much of this is going over the jurors' heads and the technical testing and the results um, and all of that? Is it worth using the valuable time that they have left? Let's go back in. Sidebar broken up. You have not rendered any opin opinion as to whether Amber Heard exhibits patterns of behavior that would suggest her allegations of abuse against Mr. Depp are false. Would you agree? No. I mean, yes, I would agree with that. Oh, thank you. And you have not... No, that's right. That's all I've got. No further questions. All thank right. You. Redirect.
You were asked about the skid. Yes. What's that? It's a structured clinical interview. Uh, it's for rendering a diagnosis. It's best for treatment because you're asking direct questions of the examinee and about symptoms. So if you have an examinee who has a tendency to minimize, you're not going to get much information. Why didn't you use it? Because, uh, well, first of all, I had a limited amount of time for my evaluation, and I had already had to uh, use, just to complete the interview was extremely time consuming. Um, and I had to even restructure it into handouts so that I could keep Ms. Hurd on track. I determined based on that, so this is where you would make an inference. So because I was having difficulty um, getting direct answers to my questions from Ms. Hurd, um, I had determined that creating forms of those questions would be a better use of the time, which it was. And then I further deduced that adding on the structured clinical interview would probably be unproductive, given that I had limited time and needed to use the best, most reliable methods for getting information in that time. You were asked about the APA specialty guidelines. Yes. Specifically uh, 1.02 and yes. 1.03. Mm -hmm. Have you complied with them? I have. No further questions. Thank All you. Right. Thank you. Dr. Kerr, you can have a seat in the corner. You, You're free to go. Thank you, ma'am. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, let's go ahead and take our morning recess for 15 minutes. Do not discuss the case and do not do any outside research, okay?